Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to give this talk in the Philosophy and Activism seminars. Shout out to David Killeran for making this possible, for organizing this. The topic I will discuss is uh, the apple of discord between Peter Singer and disability activists. This is a very hot topic, one that um, I got to uh, know it firsthand. So in 2015, University of Bucharest awarded Peter Singer an honorary doctorate. I was there, I was part of the organization. Uh, we were very happy to, uh, to award him an honorary doctorate. But at the same time, we got many messages from uh, a lot of organizations, um, disability activists, Christian activists. There were some pressures from within the university. So we were a little bit disappointed about that. In any case, we got to know firsthand this apple of discord between Peter Singer and disability activists. Now, I'll give you some examples of the claims that Peter Singer um, made and are circulated. Of course, many of them are um, taken out of context, but in any case, these are uh, some examples uh, at which disability activists react. Two quotes I give here from Practical Ethics. The first one is, some members of other species are persons, some members of our own species are not. So it seems that killing, say, a chimpanzee is worse than killing of a gravely defective human who is not a person. The second uh, paragraph that I chosen is also from um, Practical Ethics. And here Singer says, there are intellectually disabled humans who have less claim to be regarded as self-aware or autonomous than many non-human animals. If we use this, these characteristics to place a gulf between humans and other animals, we place these less able humans on the other side of the gulf. And if the gulf is taken to mark a difference in moral status, then these humans would have the moral status of animals rather than humans. So here you get um, the feeling of what kind of uh, claims steered up uh, controversy. Now, disability activists have reacted in, 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 in various ways, but I've chosen some maybe of the uh, most um, controversial ones. Uh, Peter Singer has been called by, uh, by disability, by some disability activists as a proponent of uh, genocide, a baby killer, a monster, similar as many intellectual progenitors of the Nazi euthanasia program. Of course, the most frequent association between um, Peter Singer is uh, with the Nazi euthanasia program, and it has um, a big rhetoric effect if, if you make such kind of, of, of connections. Now, the question for me is how to understand these apple of discord between singer and disability activists. My claim is that this disagreement is not about the content of the disagreement. And it's also not about an opposition to an utilitarian ethics. Sometimes this disagreement is characterized as an, an, an opposition between 
utilitarian ethics and Christian ethics or non-utilitarian ethics. I don't think that that's, that's, uh, that's fundamentally the case. For me, also, this disagreement is not about heartless reasoners or philosophers as heartless reasoners and emotionally unstable activists. In other words, it is not a conflict. It is not a disagreement between reason and, and emotion. So then what's the apple of discord really about? My suggestion is that we have debaters that are embedded in different methodological environments. So it's not about the content of the disagreement, it's about that people do their philosophical work or do their uh, activism in different methodological environments. Now, as you can see, I did not uh, put simply methodology, but I put methodological environment instead because this for me is a broader concept. It includes much more than methodological rules. So for me, a methodological environment includes methodological rules, regulative maxims. These regulative maxims uh, point out the direction in which you want to go, informal and semi-informal rules of doing the research or gathering knowledge emulating what the big names do in the field, forming groups of debate that adhere largely to the same methodological ethos and aspirations. Here, I want to briefly sketch the methodological environment in which Peter Singer does his philosophical work. Here, the focus is on theoretical ethical argument. That is a focus on conceptual analysis, normative analysis of implications, theoretical systematizations of examples and counterexamples. You also see a choice for revisionist or liberationist methodology, which um, consists in the assumption that intuitions to particular cases are often unreliable and do not reflect deep moral truths. You also see encouraging the free scope of seeing where the argument leads. And you can often, a uh, singer often uh, refers to, uh, to Bentham's methodological maxim uh, namely, if the quantity of pleasure be the same, pushpin is as good as poetry. So if you follow the argument where it leads, you reach the conclusion that something which is very boring, such as pushpin, is as good as poetry, the romantic poetry that we all love. You also see the maxim that there are no taboos. Almost everything is up for debate. In the methodological environment of Peter Singer, hypothetical scenarios and extreme cases are very useful. By extreme cases, I mean chromosomal disorder, severe forms of Down syndrome. And by hypothetical scenarios, I mean thought experiments. Here, we are using thought experiments to reveal intrinsic features of moral permissibility or desirability. A famous example of a thought experience is Nozick's experience machine to criticize uh, the intrinsic features of utilitarianism about what is desirable. You also use 
hypothetical scenarios or extreme cases to challenge moral distinctions. For example, physicians routinely withdraw life support from severely disabled newborns. And the question is here is how is this very different from allowing parents to decide in consultation with their doctors to end the life of a baby when the child has the disabilities so serious that the family believes this will be the best for the child or for the family as a whole. And lastly, in this methodological environment, nuance is decisive, nuance matters. And the example, the, maybe the best example is the flourishing field of trolleology. You see various uh, examples and versions of trolley dilemma with the aim to test our moral intuitions. And you see very small differences in these variations in order to develop a systematization of examples and counter examples. Now, the same is true also in debates about abortion and euthanasia. Now let's have a look at what I think characterizes the methodological environment of disability activists. And here, the focus is on knowledge of historic injustices and thus evaluating normative ideas, for example, about euthanasia in terms of how they play out in extrinsic conditions of political, social, and economic inequality. Further, the focus here is on epistemic injustice. And I, I, gave, I give you this very nice quote from um, the, uh, Simon Jarrett's book, Those They Call Idiots, because I find it uh, very illustrative. And I quote, inside or outside the asylum, this group, he refers to um, disabled um, people, seem to live in a strange parallel world. They were of this world, but not in it. I came to know many people labeled intellectually disabled as individuals, as hopeful, striving human beings, often with the same preoccupation and aspirations as me. But unlike me, however, they were only seen as human in certain ways and somehow not accorded full human status. Their preoccupations and aspirations would go largely unheard. The focus on epistemic injustice is to see that these people, this few, the, um, disabled um, people were vo voiceless, were not heard, and um, mainly because they were not considered uh, full, human, full humans. Also, in this methodological environment, disabled lives are not subject of debate. Further, you can see the focus on forming policy and policy implementation rather than on uh, theoretical ethical argument. And from this point of view, ethical arguments as are seen as having an agenda. So they are not purely neutral. Again, nuances hardly matter in practice. Hence, you can see a focus on slippery slope arguments or slippery slope uh, observations. Intuitions are considered, are considered reliable because they are rooted in anger in the face of injustice. Also, intuitions have tactical value to motivate and mobilize people. Lastly, 
what I think it is a characteristic of this methodological environment, extreme and severe case, cases are seen as misleading in practice because there is a variety of benign cases. Highlighting extreme and severe cases can perpetuate prejudice in practice. So those who activate in this methodological environment are suspicious about the appeal to extreme and severe cases because in practice, it has the potential to perpetuate prejudice. Now, the disagreement seen through, through my suggestion that um, there are different methodological environments and um, it, it seems as if um, the two camps just debate past each other and do not fully understand uh, from where they come from. But I think from my suggestion about different methodological environments, there are two implications or there are two, two observations that I would, I would like to make uh, for each camp. So this is for Peter Singer's methodological environment. Now, the problem, if you understand uh, the methodological environment of disability activists is jumping immediately from ethical argument to policy. So even if it is true, for example, that infanticide is morally permissible and we want to change practice, we still want to be very prudent with regards to policy because we do not have full control over the extrinsic conditions of policy implementation and oversight. And I think we are better advised if we look at what disability activists highlight or assume or make the object of their focus we are better advised to avoid policy talk immediately after ethical argument. For example, a, an ethical argument about the nature of persons and who counts as persons, especially in issues in which there is a persistent history of stripping away the moral consideration of certain groups. So the lesson I think is even if you develop theoretical ethical argument and you do want to change practice, which is normal for philosophers who do applied ethics, it's one thing to develop an ethical argument and it's another thing to design, implement and the oversight of policy. These are not these do not include conditions that are under the control of the philosopher and disability activists are aware that institutions are fragile are vulnerable and there's no full control over how policy gets to be implemented can change in time and um, can have a different face in the end a different face from what you initially intended now, this is a lesson for the methodological environment in which Peter Singer activates. But now let me draw, uh, uh, let, let me give an example to see exactly uh, what I mean. And I, I give you here, uh, a quote from Michael Tooley famous article on abortion and infanticide. And you can see here that immediately after he finishes the ethical argument, he starts to talk about policy in a, in a rather um, loose way and, and, and for my taste rather kind of superficial. And I quote, 
since it is virtually certain that an infant at such a stage of its development does not possess the concept of a continuing self and thus does not possess a serious right to life, there is excellent reason to believe that infanticide is morally permissible in most cases where it is otherwise desirable. The practical moral problem can thus be satisfactorily handled by choosing some time of period, such as a week after birth, as the interval during which infanticide will be permitted. This interval could then be modified once psychologists have established the point at which a human organism comes to believe that it is a continuing subject of experiences and other mental states. Now we can agree with Thule about whether someone possesses a serious right to life, but when he starts to make claims about whether the practical moral problem can be satisfactorily handled in practice, this is not uh, part of the argument. This is not something that he can control. Also, uh, disability activists or those who do their, their work in the methodological environment of disability activists will find very suspicious claims such as uh, what psychologies, psychologists establish in practice, how the oversight is being carried out and so on. So this is for me is, is, a, is a good example to see, um, to clarify how ethical argument gets entangled with practical consideration and extrinsic conditions, which are not under the control of philosophers, which are not part of the argument per se. And disability activists rightly highlight that uh, these are conditions for potential abuse. And, and now I want to highlight what I think it is a lesson on the part of disability activists. Now, in order to, to avoid what I think it is the trap of repulsive results is to make an analogy with decision-making in poker. So I want to make the analogy with, with how people uh, make decisions in, in poker. In poker, when we lose a hand, we react negatively towards our decision. When we win a hand, we react positively towards our decision of how we play. Thus, we create a strong connection between a result, a particular result, and the quality, credibility, reliability of the decisions which have preceded them. But this is a trap. Because in poker, a bad result is not the result of a bad decision making. We tend to look at the result rather than at the quality of the decision making and the procedures which we followed to reach that result. Similarly, I think we create a strong connection between Peter Singer and controversial claims about disabled lives. We look at the content of the claims, but not at the methodological environment that produced such claims. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that Singer's claims about the value and status of disabled lives are bad results. What I'm saying is that you have to do a holistic evaluation of the methodological environment in which Peter Singer does his philosophical work. 
it has to be made clear that the same methodological environment that produced normative results about disabled lives has also produced normative results about the moral emancipation of animals, about elevating the moral status of animals. So you cannot sharply dissociate and eliminate what you do not like. All these different normative results come from the same methodological environment. And I think this is, this is a lesson um, for disability activists to understand the methodological environment in its more complex form and not to focus only on one bad result. Because we will fall into the trap of bad results, a trap that uh, it's, it's very attractive if, if you look at the analogy with uh, poker and decision making in poker. So I finish here. Hope you'll find this interesting. And I'm looking forward to your comments, criticism, and questions. Thank you again.